And I just want to thank everybody for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Jennifer, and I am the Nevada consultant for Moms Clean Air Force and organizer. I just uh, helped open the chapter here for Moms Clean Air Force in August. So we are brand speaking new here in Nevada. <laughs> so, but we have over 41 other chapters across the United States, and we are a million moms and dads strong, um, supporting. Um, the fight against the causes of climate change um, to protect our children's future. So I'm going to open the door first for our lovely um, co-host, <laughs> our sponsors with us at this event, and have them speak um, so you know a little bit about their program as well. And then uh, we will get the panel speaking. Rito, Nevada. We see the health impact pollution close up and personal. Most Nevadans don't even equate climate change as being an issue here in our beautiful state. But nearly 1.2 million acres in Nevada during the 2017 wildfire season, and on top of it, mining as companies are not shutting their sites down, which is causing pollution to our water, <laughs> has caused three super fun sites here in Northern Nevada. And a fourth one may even be coming now um, with Lake. Lake. Um, these are all stressors on top of it to our rivers and polluting our air and water combined. Um, so the proposed budget um, right now from this administration, they want to cut 31% from the EPA from what has already been a 20% cut. So if we add that up, that's 51%. And uh, how that affects Nevada personally is our fire departments are funded partly by the EPA and our uh, forestry and the NBF <laughs> is um, they get grants from the EPA. So if we start losing these grants, it's actually affecting the men and women that go out fighting our fire. They can't go do pre burns, they can't eliminate overgrowth from all these floods we've been getting because we're not getting enough water to keep up with the growth. So um, it's pretty personal here in Nevada if you add floods, fire, and super fun sites. Um, to finish the, my speech, I cannot leave without mentioning Michael Dorson, and it's another reason why we're here tonight. Um, he is this administration's um, nomination for chemical safety and um, the pollution office for the EPA. Here's a little information to help you learn why Moms Clean Air Force and many others do not want to see this nomination go through and how it will affect all of us locally. Um, the controversial Trump nominee is to lead the Chemical Safety Office of the EPA. Michael Dorson is a deeply conf conflicted chemical indus industry hired gun who should be especially concerning to Nevada families. Dorson has long been the industry's go-to man to downplay health concerns about the toxic chemicals, including chemicals that have containment, drinking water, and communities like our tribal nations um, across Nevada. PFOA is a toxic chemical that tie is tied to cancer. Um, developmental toxic toxicity, sorry, <laughs> of other serious health concerns. It has been um, discovered in our groundwater in Fallon at the Naval Air Station in Fallon. Um, and PFOA is another um, compound that has been detected in dozens of military sites across the nation. Levels of PFOA in the groundwater in Fallon have been recorded as high as 6,720 parts per billion. This is exceeding the current EPA health advisory of 0 0.07. 0 0.07 and it's 6,720 parts per billion. Um, so, and um, to top that off in Fallon a decade ago, it was rocked with childhood cancer cases for which scientists were unable to find answers. This was exemplifying the need for officials who can deliver impartial, trustworthy work on chemical safety. So yet, an indus um, industry emails and covered by The Intercept reveals that the DuPonts believe Dorson could help them downplay the, cor the concerns of the PFA because he has a firm and a very good reputation 
among the folks that are still in business of the blessings of this criteria. Um, in West Virginia, Dorson helped DuPont um, argue the weaker standards for PFOA and then helped the company defend the chemical in courts in the states um, like Virginia and Ohio. Um, Dorson also argued for the standards of the PFOA in 2002 that was 10 times less protective than the EPA standards at the time. Um, which was 150 times less protective than DuPont's own standards, and then th it was a thousand times less protective than the EPA's current standards. Um, so basically, he makes a career of going around, and which I don't know if you know all the facts. Also, he used to work for the EPA, so he was a toxologist, which we have one on our board today, and he knows about these chemicals. But then he created a nonprofit actually to go around and help these companies learn to go around this and how to be their lawyer and fight for them to go around the rules of what the EPA was making. So um, Dorson has recommended standards that were much less protective than those set by impartial authorities. If confirmed, Dorson would be in charge with overseeing the safety of chemicals and determining whether what levels they need to be regulated at. Dorson's long record of downplaying concerns about chemicals for his industrial um, clients makes him the wrong choice for this job. Nevada families cannot trust Dorson to protect them from the toxic chemicals or to provide the sound, trustworthy advice that residents in Henderson, Nevada, Fallon, right now are currently um, facing, and of course across Nevada and we deserve much better. To close off with the concerns of the EPA 31% cut proposed budget and the nomination of Dorsen, I urge, I urge and ask you all to write a letter to Senator Dean Heller tonight. Um, and I will personally deliver these letters to his office on Thursday with our partners, the Nevada Conservation League. We'll be going there at one o'clock. And you will find these envelopes and postcards in your handouts that we gave you tonight. And we will ask you to write the letters after you hear all the other panel speakers. And um, I do thank you all for coming tonight and for all of your questions and just for your activism. It's very important at this time. This is a serious matter and I appreciate all your time tonight. So I'm going to hand it over to the next panel speaker, which we're going to bring it. I'm not, actually, I'm going to have Amber come up. She is one of our local representatives. Um, in that Nevada Assembly, and I am so grateful that she came because it's so good to have a local representative with their voice here. So thank you, Amber. Thank you for having me. Thank you. No, thank you so much for having me. This is a room of kindred spirits. I can't believe the conversations I've already had in the hall, and I'm so thrilled that you're here with a chapter in Nevada because I can't tell you how long I personally, as a mom, have been on a crusade about clean air and, um, and clean water for our kids. And so to know that there's a movement now is really exciting. So I'm thrilled to be here today. Thank you for having me. Um, we were asked to just speak for a few minutes about um, our different perspectives on, on uh, things that we've worked on or um, ways that, from my perspective as a legislator, ways that you as the public can be involved in affecting our policies in these areas. And um, so just a little bit about me. Um, I actually in college had planned to be an environmental attorney. I was pretty obsessed with environmental issues. Um, but I now work more in public health. And to me, there's a, a, a definite connection there. Um, we talk, and so I love this panel. I mean, <laughs> um, in public health, we often talk about um, you know, safety for children. And a lot of that um, does have to do with everything is related, right? So um, a lot of our chronic diseases currently are either created by or exacerbated by um, problems in our environment. And so many of our, not just chronic conditions, but some of the things like cancer, some of the um, even mental health issues that people are having, they're starting to think now, you know, may have genetic predispositions with environmental triggers. So all of this is definitely related. So for me, it's definitely something I'm passionate about. Um, I often tell the story that my husband and I, we both grew up Nevadans. I grew up here in Reno, and he grew up in rural Nevada in Lovelock. And we always tell people, you know, we lived all over. We went to Washington, D.C. and Oregon. And if you had asked me in high school if I would have been back, I would have said, of course not. No, heck no, right? Um, but we moved home largely because we always tell the story of Lake Tahoe, right? We missed Lake Tahoe. 
And when we talk about Lake Tahoe, it's like we miss a family member. I mean, people think we're crazy. But when you look at the gorgeous natural environment we have here, it's not just Lake Tahoe, it's the Truckee Meadows, the Truckee River. Um, I bought a house on Rancho San Rafael Park so my kids would have that experience of the Arboretum. The natural resources that we have here are exceptional. And so for me, it's always been, it's a lifelong passion to try to make sure that we preserve that. So when you talk about the fires and the floods, I'm concerned about those too. So as a state legislator, there's a lot that we can't do. A lot of it is federal. And in fact, what concerns me a lot at the federal level right now is that our state environmental protection department largely just enforces the federal law. We haven't done a lot in Nevada to enshrine in state law some of those protections and laws like other states have. And what concerns me is that as the federal regulations start to decline under this administration, we, may, we are just going to keep enforcing to the lowest level. And we may need to reinforce in state law. This next coming session would be my concern. Reinforce in state law some of those higher standards so we maintain the floor at least. Now in my book, we should be increasing. And last session we had a bill, for example, on um, the renewable portfolio standard. We tried to make it so that 50% of our energy in the state by 2030 had to be renewable. Uh, we made it through both houses of the legislature, but unfortunately it was vetoed. Um, and so we keep making attempts, but what I'm thrilled about with this group is we need you all in the public and your stories and your passion to be there in the building making noise and making your representatives know that this is a priority. Because we had 1,100 bills last session, and unfortunately some of these issues just don't rise to the top. And with a movement, with noise, we can make it a priority. So there were some other bills that we attempted last session that I personally felt really strongly about but didn't make it. Uh, we had a ban on hydraulic fra fracturing, um, which would have been amazing. I'd worked on that when I worked with the Nevada State Medical Association. Um, unfortunately, it did not, um, it died in the Senate. It made it through the assembly, the house that I'm in, but it died in the Senate. Um, we had um, a ban on plastic bags, for example, which would um, contribute to, you know, decrease the, the landfill issues and also all kinds of issues in produ producing those darn bags, right? Um, that didn't even get a hearing. Um, we had um, all kinds of, um, uh, we did have a pos two positive things. One was that the Environmental Commission can increase fees for water violations now, for water providers when they are fined or violate certain water laws, they can now be fined at a higher rate. That was a positive one, that was AB50. Um, and then I sponsored a bill on parks, trails, and open spaces. Um, I lead a Girl Scout troop, and a couple of years ago, we were visiting one of our local parks, and they had been cut by 40% their budget so much that they had nobody to take the girls on a tour of all the trees and plants that they had there. And um, so I sort of went on this mission of how can we have such cuts to our parks, and, and how can we improve that? And so I joined up actually with a group of several people who had already been working on this. And in many states, there's a thing called a park district, so we created park districts in Nevada. And what that is, is uh, it's a type of improvement district that is an overlay, but now it is an option in Nevada, a tool that we can um, gain additional funding for some of our parks and open spaces. So, um, so we're trying to make progress in that area, um, but again, we need people out there beating the drum, and that's why I think that bill was successful, is we had a coalition of the Park Foundation and, and um, Keep Trucking Men Beautiful and all kinds of groups um, rallying around that bill. Um, for me personally, <laughs> You know, as a mom, I'm obsessed. I'm this crazy mom who like, won't let my kids sleep in pajamas that are flame retardant, and um, my neighbors think I'm crazy because I won't spray for spiders or ants. And when my neighbors sprayed Telstar on my trees, I basically you know, had a conniption fit because I was counting the bees for, you know, uh, for a citizen science project and he was over there killing them. So for me personally, the pesticide issues, the, the uh, daily contaminations that our children and our families face are personal, crusade of mine, but now I'm um, glad to find other toxicologists and epidemiologists and people who, I mean, there is a community, there is a community out here who feels passionately about this and wants to make a difference in this. So what I would say as far as, um, as far as, you know, next steps or your involvement in the legislative process specifically. Um, before I was a legislator, I was a policy analyst at the Legislative Council Bureau, and I've also been a lobbyist, and so I actually have a little roadshow about how to lobby your legislature and <laughs> how to get involved, and, and I would be happy to talk to any of you um, if you want to get started on that path, but I think the most urgent thing is legislators right now are giving their bill ideas for 2019, because we don't go back into session until 2019, and we get all of our good ideas for bills from the public. All of my bills, the Parks bill came from a direct experience, right? Um, I had an elder abuse bill that came from people in the community saying this is a problem. So if you have policy ideas, laws that you think need to be changed at the state level, 
Um, you can contact me and I'm happy to, to, to uh, you know, examine with you what some policy options might be and find a good sponsor. Um, but now is the time because the first batch of bill drafts, meaning the topics that we have to turn in to our legislative council to have the bills actually written, is August. It's not that far away, it's just eight months away, right? So now is the time to think about that and to be um, planning and rallying around. And maybe, I don't know how you plan to do it, but maybe as a group, if everybody comes up with a brainstorm of ideas and policies and then decides to focus on one or two, um, I really think that we can start to make a difference and have um, laws improve if we have a, a concerted effort of the public. And then I love that the stories were mentioned earlier because I was mentioning in the hall, I, I'm a data geek, right? I went to graduate school, they called us the Quantoids. We were a club of a bunch of data geeks. <laughs> And I can't tell you how important it has, it has become apparent to me that the real stories are. I watched last session real citizens with no experience, terrified about coming to testify, absolutely change the minds of legislators. And one on one, they would go into a legislator's office and simply tell their life story and why this bill was important to them, and it switched people's minds. And so we need to hear from you. We need to hear how laws are affecting you. And I think a topic like it, such as this, where it affects our families and our children so much, is really a, a, a one that we need to, to be louder about. I think what people forget is that climate change drives migration. If homelands are ra ravaged by natural disasters, people have no choice but to leave their homelands. Um, I try to make sure that the work that I do with uh, Bad War Progress is intersectional, like I mentioned. And in case you don't know uh, what intersectionality means, it refers to the uh, simultaneous experience of categorical and hierarchical classifications, including, but not limited to, race, class, gender, and sexuality, and nationality. And it's pretty ironic that among Trump's first policies on his agenda, um, it was a crackdown on immigrant communities, followed by the dismantling of climate and environmental protections. It's calling for Muslim bans and empowering Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE, to deport millions with little to no due process. His administration's short-sighted and deliberate decisions to invest in fossil fuel in the fossil fuel industry means that he is effectively aiding the process of creating more migrants. Naval bases and Air Force bases, and so um, Fallon is not unique in its exposure to PFOA, PFOS, um, Gen X, whatever these other products are that are all in that same family. So I think we're going to, you know, jet fuel, airports, that kind of stuff, and they do training with that foam at Naval bases and Air Force bases, and so um, Fallon is not unique in its exposure to PFOA, PFOS. Um, Gen X, whatever these other products are that are all in that same family. So I think we're going to hear more about it because um, there's a lot more exposure to PFOA than anybody else. But anyways, what do I do? Um, I'm an associate professor of epidemiology at UNR. Uh, most of my research is aimed at um, creating evidence that informs the standard setting of the Clean Air Act. So that's what I do. Um, and uh, tonight I'm here to talk about climate change and health. And it's interesting to think about, well, how do we study one Earth where the climate's changing and another where it's not? We don't have that. And so what we end up having to do is take advantage of the variability that we actually have. So we have hot days in the summer and milder days, or we have higher air pollution days, and lower air pollution days. We go, okay, well, this is what we know about the association between air pollution and health, or heat and health, and this is what temperatures are going to be like in the future, and so we can. Now, how you calculate those dollars is is challenging, right? We say, well, what is the value of preventing an asthma attack? What is the value of uh, preventing a premature death? And we can argue about how you put those dollars in amount, and some people find it very distasteful, but if you're not willing to do it, you can't be below it or above it. Um, ozone is a real challenge out west. If you could imagine a world with no humans in it, we would still have ozone levels of about 0.05 on this graph maybe 0.04, somewhere in that ball. Cities most polluted by short term, 24 hour PM 2.5. Here we are, number 10 in the country. So while we have a lot of good days, when we have bad days, there are bad days. Right? We had, as a family, I have an eight year old boy, and we had a very scary thing happen a couple years ago where he had scary high levels of aluminum in his blood. 
and it was affecting his behavior and he was off the hook and people wanted to medicate him and we don't do that so we didn't do that um, but in finding the way of speaking to all of this together I realized that environmental activists have a great rate of depression and even suicide and so from my underpinnings and the part that I didn't tell you about myself and working for nonprofits for a lot of years is that I look for every single natural way to go about doing things myself and letting plants heal myself because I was very depressed once upon a time. Um, so when my boy had these heavy metals, um, it made life so much more challenging, right? Kids are challenged in a handful anyway. But um, when they're really bouncing high and not responding to normal things, um, it can get scary. So I started digging and learning about essential oils and healing modalities that are alternative that most doctors don't talk about. And we actually got an extra person um, that I was not expecting, that I'm very glad she's here. Charlene is the division director of the air quality management here in Washoe County. So I asked her to speak. Um, so she's a little extra person, but please come on up, Charlene, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Yeah, I um, received a call. We have a group, uh, Truckee Meadows Healthy Communities, that works with Renown and a lot of the organizations. And so I got an email a couple of days ago, and they said, can you go over and just kind of give a, a regulatory perspective? Um, a lot of people don't realize that air travels just like water does, path of least resistance, and we actually do get drainage in um, areas that are a basin, just like water settles to the bottom, pollution does the same thing. Sparks is actually our low point in the Truckee Meadows, and it also is one of our older neighborhoods that has a lot of wood stoves in it, and a lot of fireplaces. Wood stoves we can regulate pretty well, Fireplaces are a structural part of the house, so there's a bunch of old fireplaces over there. So when we do get strong inversions like we have today, typically that will be our high number. So that's just a little side note. That, and we're making sure people comply with the regulations and whatever they have going on. When our monitoring data comes in, it should show an improvement. And they throw a big old chunk of coal in their wood stove and damp it down and heat the house all night long. Well, all of that went right outside. So when I hear um, people talk about their children getting sick, I have an asthmatic daughter. I understand this, it all gets close to home. We have to look at what we do too. We can regulate industry. We can put controls on them. We reduce their emissions, but we need to look at us too. So the um, number one source of emissions in Washoe County is our vehicles. So when we talk about growth and expansion and spreading out the sprawl, the thing that I hear is vehicle miles traveled. So that's the thing that we're trying to work the most on is to reduce vehicle miles traveled. Whether it's the, the optimum thing is smart development. To, to build, we call it the inner ring, the inner McCarran circle. If we build here instead of 30 miles outside of town, we get people that can use um, mass transit, you can use RTC, you can walk, you can bike, um, alternative transportation, active transportation, all of those things lead to um, preventing chronic disease. It all comes together, I've heard it from everybody that's all linked together, it really is. And it all starts with us. So at Air Quality, we realize, um, looking at our data, looking at the modeling that EPA has done, we actually are only responsible for the modeling um, for about 16% of the emissions that we see in Washoe County. The rest of it is a gift from somewhere. Whether the wind's blowing from the north, south, east, or west, air is all connected. It's going to travel through. So we have 16% that we can, we can do something about. So that's, to start, that's the little piece we're working with. When I see the American Lung Association come out and say we get an F in, in air quality, it really breaks my heart because we work so hard to make things so much better. And we have done a significant amount over the years to reduce the emissions here. I did work with um, the American Lung Association when this year's report came out. We have been talking with them every year. I've been in air quality in Washoe County for 23 years now. They actually put, if you're, if you're interested, go to the American Lung Association report 
And if you look at Washoe County and you look at the, that top 10 list where we are in the, the bad particulates for PM 2.5, there actually is a note down there that says Reno, Nevada is one of the areas that's subject to wildfire smoke. And so that F grade we get for short term, 24 hour particulate, is all wildfire. And take questions and settings, we're opening up to the panel, so please write it down and then if there's a panel member that you specifically want to ask a question to, just raise your hand and I'll bring the microphone over to you. Or if you feel your voice is strong enough, I don't need to bring the microphone to you. Um, I'm going to actually ask you to get the um, postcards you got in the little handout that, I hand, that was handed to you when you came in. It has a envelope, like so. <laughs> And we put it on a postcard so it's a little harder for you to surface to write on so it's not as flimsy. Um, and we are going to deliver these notes to Heller. And based upon what you've heard tonight from the panel speakers um, uh, and, and myself, either regarding the EPA regulations and also the um, uh, Dorson issue that's coming up, uh, that is going to be voted on Dorson, the vote for Dorson, I believe, may be this month, so that's why we're kind of putting an urgency behind that to hear, hopefully Senator Heller will hear our voice that we don't want this man elected, um, put into the position he's going to. I do want to emphasize how important your voice is. Um, when I first started this in June and I went and spoke to Congressman Amaday, I was basically told, you know, he doesn't want to hear much about climate change, get in there, say your story, you know, the yada, 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 and then you get out. Um, which, when I got into his office, his staff was really um, excited to have the conversation once we started telling our personal stories and how they were affecting it, how it was affecting us here in Northern Nevada. And of course, when I went in there in June, that's the prime time the fire was hitting especially here in Reno. I think there was three fires all around. I flew over it and took a picture and video and showed it to them as we were going on because they were trying to say, oh, all the fires are in California. And sometimes I just feel they're not connected to what's going on here in Northern Nevada. So that's why it's really important that you use your voice. Um, when I went back in July, they had more questions. They were ready for us when we came in. Um, and we found out that Congressman Amade from, from our group coming in and another group coming in decided to start working with UNR and is going to be, he's joined the Climate Change Caucus, um, one of the few Republicans on the caucus, but he is now, he wants to talk about it. And he also is going to be submitting his first draft for a carbon tax for Nevada. Um, so it does matter. <laughs> Your voice does matter. So, yeah. How will Amade vote, though? I mean, it doesn't matter if he placates you and... and it's true. I told him the same way. I'm saying all the good things you're telling me. <laughs> do you think he will vote? I hope so. I, you know, I feel he did... He kept me in a room for an hour and a half talking about it. So, um, I was late for my next meeting with Catherine Masto. <laughs> Senator Masto, but... It was worth it because we had the conversation and I, he grew up here. I grew up in Douglas County, he's from Carson. He told me if he knew if I was coming from Douglas, he probably would not let me in the room. <laughs> but we, he, we had a good bantering, but also he had questions for me and when I left the meeting, he said, this is what I want you to find out and this is what I'm gonna find out. And we keep coming back with a better conversation every time. So in my opinion and my hopes, is that he will follow through with what he's saying. And this is being recorded tonight, so hopefully he hears that as well. <laughs> um, so, but I would love for you to um, put your personal story on here and how this affects you, how you see it in Washoe County, whichever county you're from. Um, I'm personally from Douglas County, and when I hear the standards for the air quality in Washoe County, it makes me jealous because Douglas County doesn't have an air monitoring system right now, and we get covered with smoke, and we don't even know what our air quality is. I came out when we had huge fires, and 
saw that it said it was good air quality, and I walked out the door and couldn't even see um, Joe speak. And I called Senator Masto, sent her a video, and said, there's no way that this is good air quality. My throat is burning right now as I breathe in, and this is not safe for my son. And it's become a hyper story to me because I've met a mother who lost her son this year due to fires. Um, her son had severe asthma, and when she was following the air quality readings of whether it was good or bad, it said it was okay. So she sent her son to school, but then didn't let him go out and play and go outside, but let him go to school. Normally on hazardous days, she wouldn't even allow him to go to school. Well, she woke up the next morning and her son was gone to an asthma attack. So as a mother, it brings tears to my eyes right now thinking about that. So we have to do something about this. So I urge you to put your stories on here and um, however this has impacted your heart and why you're here tonight, I'm thankful for your time. And as we're, I'll give you a little break to get some snacks and we'll sit back down and whatever questions you have for the panel, they are here for you, okay? The first question is, how does air, water, soil pollution affect the health of the patients in the Washoe County, in meaning the constituents, the same constituents. Does anybody feel comfortable answering that question? I can actually answer that question with a teensy bit. Um, I have a degree in wildlife ecology and conservation, so that means I understand natural biomes and whatnot. And the question, again, where was it? I'm going to reread it for you. How does water, air, and soil, etc., pollution affect the health of the patients you serve? Um, on a personal biological level, what this kind of interaction can do is affect how your body produces hormones, how your body has, uh, how healthy your immune system is. Um, coming down to when you're interacting with soils and water, there are so many different bacteria in there that are actually beneficial for us to create a healthy immune system. And a lot of people don't actually know that most of our mood is produced in our gut. So if we start modifying the microbiomes of the entire system of the planet, what ends up happening is that everybody's mood changes, hence why we talked about uh, depression and uh, suicide and everything like that. Um, and what else can I put into that part? Um, really, that's kind of the gist of it, is that the, the, the small interactions on that, na on that, that level end up in the long run making a big impact and we don't see the effects every single day but the cumulative effects o over time become exponentially worse and so there's going to be a point at which we will see kind of like a point of no return for the environment it's going to be completely affected permanently uh, where the microbiome will not be the same as 200 years ago uh, we already actually see a lot of probiotics being used and et cetera, that are really being um, pushed forward just to make people healthier than they can be every, than they can naturally be with our diet. Um, being that a lot of products that go into the, the ground and the water also aren't filtered out. They're not biodegradable in certain ways, so they start accumulating continuously. Um, what can families do to protect our children from fires in our surrounding areas? I think Rebecca's got this one. So, um, I'm going to stand in, sorry guys. So, what can we do about protecting our children from wildfires in our surrounding areas? So, essentially, you can watch um, that, the, um, the rating for fire and you can keep your kids inside. And I admit that I coached soccer for a long time and I did not know until recently how dangerous smoke and being outside was. You know, I was like, eh, sunshine, you know, air, being inside, playing Nintendo. Um, and, but as far as like, why are we having mega fires and what can we do about it, you know, proactively, um, realistically, I mean, climate change is a huge factor in that. We have warmer seasons, our fire season is now exponentially longer. As we pointed out, we're in December, we have this fire down in, um, in California. And so from a proactive individual level, you know, doing those important things like 
how much are we consuming? How much are we aiding and abetting manufacturing? How much are we uh, using fossil fuels? Those are all things that we can personally take responsibility for and try to mitigate the damages that climate change are going to bring. Um, it's not something that we're going to be able to stop, but we can certainly start uh, navigating you know, what each of us can do personally as far as being consumers. And I'm really proud that we're Nevadans. You know, we have so much public land, and I think that that is a really beautiful thing, um, but it is worthy of the fact that we do need to preserve it as much as we can. And that starts with us making individual decisions, whether that's bringing, you know, your own bags to the grocery store so you're not consuming more extra plastic, um, or if that means standing up and fighting for our public lands and saying, you know, these are the things that we want to see happen legislatively so that we are protecting what we have left here. Perfect, thank you. Um, oh, oh, Matthew's going to answer, Dr. Matthews. I'm not sure if this is this question or the last question, but the comment about lead made me think, uh, you know, whenever uh, my wife or I are invited to baby showers, we always give lead testing kits as a baby shower present. Because rather than like something you don't actually need, right? Um, and lead is maybe not as big of an issue out west because the housing stock is newer compared to what it is. Um, but like my mother in law, you know, she lives in the Bay Area, but if she was in Reno, she would be here tonight. And so she's got this entire collection of all the toys from my wife when she was a child that she has saved and things like that. And um, you know, you'd be surprised. My daughter was playing with this Barbie stuff from the 1970s, and there's these little metal dishes, and they're made out of lead, right? And, um, you know, even though they're not supposed to have lead in them, toys from China can have lead in them. Toys from anywhere can have lead in them, right? There's all sorts of things. And so I think lead is one of those things that there's no known level of lead that is not associated with deleterious effects. It doesn't mean you're lead poisoning if you have a little bit of lead. But it, there is no lead, amount of lead that is good for you. And so um, being aware that if you have a house that was built before 1977, I believe, uh, that there could be lead paint, um, and paying attention to that is something that can really be important for protecting kids. Thank you. Linnell has a comment for the first question as well. Can you take a look at it? Yes. So I think the question was, how do we protect our children? Uh, okay, so I'm gonna talk about water for a second. Water pollution affect the health of residents, okay? We drink our river water, so that's a big deal. I worked in stormwater protection for the city for almost 10 years, and I can tell you that everything that goes down the gutter goes into the river. So um, stopping your gutter flow, um, stopping your roof runoff from getting into the gutter, putting it back in the ground, getting it in the soil, right? That's gonna treat the water, whatever's coming off those shingles or whatever it is that's on your roof or whatever's coming off your pavement, you know, get it into the ground, into the landscape instead of into the gutter and the storm drain. So that's number one, right? Because we put all kinds of stuff out there, like we kill spiders and we, we get black widows at my house, right? So what are we gonna do? Let the kid get stung? No, <laughs> right? We put chemicals out, but let's, really be mindful with safe alternatives anytime we can. That means fertilizers, that means weed killer, weed be gone. I mean, you look at the stuff that's in these things that we buy off the shelf at Home Depot, and it's crazy. Not suspected carcinogen, but way down the pipe towards most likely carcinogen. So um, think about things like that when you're you know, washing your car in the gutter. Go to the car wash instead. We don't need to be drinking the soap suds. And while Tumwa does a great job of killing the E. coli, so we're not going to get sick drinking our tap water. They do not pull chemicals out of our drinking water. So filtering water at the house is a really good idea. We've got some of the best drinking water in the world right here. I mean, I've been around the world a couple of times, and it, we got great water. And so protecting our source waters is a big thing we can do for our kids, because once we degrade the river, and once we continue with this crazy construction, and we've silted in all the good, you know, trout spawning habitats, we can't turn that around. We can't just vacuum it out. So those are a couple things. Um, one other thing I just want to suggest is, Washoe County voters have turned down fluoridation of our drinking water three times now, I think, and they keep bringing it back. It's a dental group down in Las Vegas, 
and they're trying to get rid of the fluoride containing chemicals that's a waste product by fluoridating our water. Tumwa has no chemicals that are that toxic in their entire operations and they want to put it in our drinking water. So Tumwa's probably not going to come out and say, we don't want to do this. They're going to go by voter, voter demand. Each time the Washoe County voters have been asked to address this issue, the margin has gotten narrower, closer to 50%. That scares me. So please, fluoride is a neurotoxin. It de degrades the IQ of people who drink it. The EPA noticed that the rate of morality during the heat waves isn't a, as high as the one in Chicago. Could it be due to the increase of AC? You know what? I, I didn't see a formal presentation on that. It was just something that Wayne said sort of in passing. But I wouldn't be surprised if air conditioning had a role in it. I mean, it makes sense that it would, but I don't know. And I and I actually looked briefly this afternoon when I was making my slides to see if I could find a publication or a website on EPA that showed trends in mortality with and I didn't see it. So I don't think it's something that they've published, but I don't know. Okay. <clears throat> Can I ask a question? Sure. Do you feel you're loud enough to use the microphone? Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, the question is, now when everything comes from the top down, and we're talking about the cuts that's going to occur in the EPA. And these cuts that's going to happen, that means that people that's working in the EPA is going to lose jobs. So that means cut in the personnel that, that are able to go around and monitor the EPA, the EPA, the water system and everything else. Now, I was at a meeting, not a meeting, but a, a seminar that was at UNR. And there was a, a, a lady that talked about the water supply in Henderson on a reservation that need to be cleaned up. But yet, we see that in a lot of the non-white communities, these things are not being, in, uh, uh, not being uh, looked at. Mm -hmm. And so, What's going to occur with that money being decreased and, and the EPA losing the personnel to be able to handle the situation that's going to occur? I think I'm going to let Natalie answer this question, but I also want to uh, mirror you in that that's exactly why we're having this meeting right now because it's not only what we're seeing with the cuts, like like I brought up on an interview I did earlier this morning, was where you're seeing forestry members being fired because they're being paid through the EPA, but they're firing the supervisors and leaving a lower paycheck as well. And then they're driving 600 miles a day to just basically drive by and go, okay, it looks okay, you know. But then, like you said, it's impacting. I've worked, I'm working with the native tribes around here with Washoe, the Washoe tribe. I've heard the same problem is, you know, what are you doing for us right now? So I'm going to pass this to Natalie because I know she has some response to this as well. Thank you. So like I was talking about in my speech, we know study after study again that uh, poor black and brown communities are the ones that are most affected by pollution and climate change. And unfortunately, because of all the cuts that are going on, like, I know Flint got a lot of attention recently because of their dirty water. They still don't have clean water. And this is how long now since that happened? More than a year? If not two, I think at this point. Um, and that's just one of the extreme examples of what happens when you don't have proper funding to keep, or well, that was a lot of other things, but um, uh, proper funding to keep track of these things. Um, so it's up to us as voters and as constituents to urge our legislators to do the right thing. Unfortunately, whether we like it or not, Trump is president and that's because he won. People voted for him. And we have to drive, that's one of my jobs as a community organizer is to make sure that my community 
is informed on all these different issues so that when they go to the polls, they're not voting against their, their best interests. So that's my job, and but I can't do it alone. I'm one person. My organization is literally seven people big, um, and we need help. We need volunteers. We need people to come out with us and help inform your neighbors. It's that easy. That's how I realized I could make a change, is I started talking to my family. I'm that girl, when I go to my family reunions, hey, are you registered to vote? <laughs> people hate me now, but I've registered so many people. Like That's how I started talking. And that's, that's how I found my voice. Um, and again, I get annoying when I go to family reunions and when I go to parties with my friends because I bring up politics and I bring up the issues because I think it's important and I think it's affected me and my family directly. Everything from climate change to immigration to all the taxes and healthcare and, you know, uh, food and stuff like access to food, like all of it affects, has affected me personally. And also, the, the, the thing that we have to look at eventually, with the right, with the rising of the the uh, uh, what is sea level, the rising of the sea level eventually is going to affect everybody. Right. 